welcome to the Glam Metal Interview Series, presented by RockMusicStar.com, with host Thomas S. Holwalt Jr. Hey everyone, this is Thomas with episode number 12 of the Glam Metal Interview Series. For this episode, I have author Doug Broad as my guest. During this interview, we discussed Doug's new book, They Just Seem a Little Weird, how Kiss, Cheap Trick, Aerosmith, and Stars remade rock and roll. This is an amazing book and a must-have if you love rock music. So here he is, our special guest for our first Zoom interview, Doug Broad. Hey everyone, this is Thomas from rockmusicstar.com, glammetal.com, and we have a great special uh, today. We have the author of a brand new amazing book called They Just Seem a Little Weird right over here. And we have Doug Brad over here on the phone with us, or on the phone, on the Zoom with us, I should say. <laughs> Doug, Glad to be here. Thank you very much. And, and how are you today, Doug? Doing well. Yeah. Yeah. Hope you are too. Yeah, I, I'm doing great. Um, I, I have to tell you, that this, this book that you wrote, um, you, you wrote about four of the most influential bands. Well, actually, three of the most successful bands in the history of rock. And one band that should have made it, but didn't quite make it, uh, and, and yet still influential, uh, Stars. So it's, it's Kiss, Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, and Stars. Um, and you did a, a, a great job of being able to intertwine their career into like, to one really entertaining story. Um, uh, how challenging was this for you? Uh, good question. It, it was fairly challenging. It took a lot of research. I spoke to, I believe, 136 people for the book. But in terms of getting the stories um, sort, of, sort of connecting, it kind of flowed pretty organically. I used as sort of the launching, the launching pad for the book, uh, Gene Simmons' 1978 solo album, on which members of all three of the other bands uh, performed. So we had a you know, Rick Nielsen from Cheat Trick on guitar. You had a guest spot from Joe Perry on guitar and Richie Rano from Stars also played guitar on that record. So I wanted to sort of use that as a jumping off point to tell the story of 70s rock through the, through the eyes of these four bands that were interconnected. Yeah, um, and uh, I mean, this must have been a real labor of love. I mean, first of all, how did you come up with this idea and, and it was, and how did you come up with the whole, like, well, we're going to start off with the Gene Simmons record? Oh, I mean, who well, thought of that? I mean, you know, I, I follow all, well, three of the bands. I'm a big Stars fan now, of course, because of you. Um, but I would have never you. thought of, I would have never thought of that connection until I first uh, read about it in your book. Well, I, I've always been a huge fan of, of, of Kiss and Cheap Trick. I mean, Kiss was my first band when I was 10 or 11 years old. And, you know, then I graduated when I graduated to Cheap Trick when I heard them a little later on. Um, and those are two bands I always wanted to write about. And I wanted to figure out a way to write about them that was unique and interesting and had not been done before. So I decided to, to, to bring them together with two other bands that were from the same circle, if you will, from the same time period. All the bands um, pretty much toured together. I mean, Stars opened for Aerosmith. Cheap Trick and Kiss toured, Cheap Trick and Aerosmith toured, Aerosmith and Kiss played some shows together in 74, and then they toured together in 2003. And then, you know, producers, Jack Douglas produced Stars, he produced Cheap Trick, he produced Aerosmith. Um, Bruce Fairbairn produced uh, Aerosmith and Kiss. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, Ted Templeman produced Aerosmith and Cheap Trick. So there are so many um, behind the scenes people and in front of the scenes people that were connected with these bands. And I thought that it was an interesting way to tell kind of a unique um, 70s hard rock story that no one's told before. And it, you know, like I said, researching it, a lot of this stuff sort of came to me and came organically and the pieces kind of fell together. And, you know, some of it really surprised me. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it came together. Yeah, have, uh, have you had the, um, any reaction from any of the people that you interviewed? Like you said, you interviewed 136 people. I mean, you, you interviewed Gene, you, Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, you, you well, have, all those guys, have any of them read the book and have any of them uh, said anything to you or give you, give you any feedback on the book? Sure. Well, um, 
I interviewed Paul Stanley for the book. I haven't heard back from him, although I did send him a copy. Um, I actually interviewed Gene Simmons for um, an article I wrote for Spin Magazine 10 years ago. So I didn't interview him for this book. He, didn't, he declined to be interviewed, but I did have a lot of outtakes from my previous interview that were germane to the subject of the book. So I was able to use that stuff. Um, I interviewed Bunny Carlos and Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. Um, I know that Rick is reading it. He, he emailed me to say that, that he's reading it, but, and he says, and he, and he, he wished me well with it. He hasn't, he hasn't sort of given me any feedback yet. I haven't heard from Bunny. I did hear from all the guys in stars who, um, are over the moon because, you know, this book, uh, gives them a lot of credit, a lot of well-deserved credit. And I think in a way it's going to put them on the map. They were, they were a bat, they were a band back in the seventies that never really got the respect they deserve or the, or the success that I think that they deserve. And, you know, I think this book is going to go a long way to um, sort of rescue or resuscitate their reputation. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I've been listening to them like pretty much nonstop. It's kind of been like, the soundtrack, the book for me has pretty much been like stars on, on uh, you know, random play though. There are four major records and mm -hmm. uh, they had some great songs and uh, it, it's just really interesting in the, in the book. I mean, I, I think uh, Bill Coyne, who was managing him at the time and, and he admits in the book, which I find kind of fascinating that he kind of admits to making a mistake was that he kind of pushed them. It, it was too much too soon for them opening in arenas and he should have like built on um, like more grassroots, you know, playing in clubs and building it up. And um, I'm just wondering if the members of the band uh, if, of Stars feel the same way. That that's a good question. You know, Stars were were a unique band because they were Bill O'Coin's second band that he managed after Kiss. So he already had he already had Kiss. Kiss had already pretty much exploded by the time um, he took Stars under his wing. Um, and you know, Bill always did things big and he, he didn't go small. So when, you know, he had Kiss as leverage, Kiss's success as leverage, and he, they, he was able to get stars, you know, right out of the, you know, right off the bat, opening for people like Peter Frampton and ZZ Top, uh, Roxy Music, play, playing theaters and uh, arenas. And, and they never really played clubs or, or dive bars. And all the other bands that I cover, you know, Kiss, Aerosmith and Cheap Trick all had to sort of come through, you know, the, the bar scene, the club scene. Yeah. Um, but stars were unique in that some of the members were already in, they, they were previously in big bands. I mean, the, the bass player of stars and the drummer of stars were both in a band called Looking Glass that had a number one hit with the song Brandy in 1972. And uh, Richie Rano, the guitarist for stars, uh, was in the last kind of the, the last lineup of this band called Stories, which had a, a big hit with uh, Brother Louie. And so, so they, came, they came up, you know, through the trenches in these other bands. So when they, you know, when they were signed by O'Coin, they, they had already had a lot of experience. So, you know, they could have started in the bars again, in the clubs again as stars. Um, but, you know, they, they, they got, you know, they got a manager who really, you know, pushed them and pushed them out there and wanted to make them a big success out of the box. When they did not become a big success out of the box, you know, everyone has their, their, you know, their opinions and the Friday, the Monday morning quarterbacking. And, and I guess he figured, you know what, it was too much too soon. I should have had them come through the trenches rather than just foist yeah. them out there in a, you know, in, in a big, you know, arena or theater setting. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I mean, they haven't, received that much exposure. I mean, you would think that would, you know, work to be beneficial to them. I mean, they were, I, I did interview Richie, um, you know, years back and, you know, asked him, you know, some of the same questions. And uh, he told me that when, when they were actually playing with Peter Frampton, when Frampton Comes Alive uh, came out, I mean, he said they were playing like, you know, half filled like theaters. And then when that album came out, of course it exploded. So, I mean, they, they had some really outstanding opportunities to, to be real popular. And, and I asked Richie, I, I said, you know, wh what do you think it was like one thing? And, and he said, um, he thought it was payola that the, 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 they weren't his record label or management, you know, weren't because that was a thing back then. They weren't paying the, the radio stations to play them. And I don't know. It's, I mean, 
I mean, that could be true. I don't really think you mentioned that in your book at all. So I'm not really too sure if that that was really an issue or if he just kind of was like, just like came up with an answer just to like appease me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's funny, you know. One of the reasons they're in the book um, is that I wanted to sort of investigate. You know, you have Kiss and Aerosmith who were like the biggest hard rock band, the biggest American hard rock bands of the mid '70s. And then you had Cheap Trick, who were like this long-running, pretty successful, not super successful, but pretty successful band. Um, and then you have, you always had this level of band like Stars and Angel and Detective and all these bands that, that and, and, and Mahogany Rush and all these bands that kind of had um, similar opportunities to these other bands, but never really made it. And, and you know, with Stars, they had Bill O'Coin, they had Capitol Records behind them for four albums. They had Jack Douglas producing their records, yet they still couldn't get a hit. And I wanted to figure, I wanted to find out why. So, you know, there are, there are a lot of kind of theories that came out during my research. You know, I think chief among them, and I think everyone kind of agreed in the band, was that they, they couldn't get a hit single. I mean, whether it was Paola, as, maybe, as you suggest, or maybe it was just that they didn't have that kind of song that merited, you know, pop status. That's what you needed back then to sell a lot of records. You needed a song on pop radio. Yeah, um, and sure. they had one song, uh, Cherry Baby, that landed at number 33 in the top 40, which is a pretty good showing, but it wasn't enough to move the needle for them. And, you know, it just it just didn't work. So... You know, that's one of the things I try to do in the book is try to find out why a band at that level wasn't able to go to the next level. Do, do you think maybe, I mean, that is a great song, Cherry Baby is an amazing song. I mean, it's one of my, probably one of my favorite songs ever. It's it's great. Um, do you think maybe because it wasn't heavy enough? I mean, I mean, compared to like Aerosmith, what they were releasing at the time and Cheap Trick wasn't really heavy, but I mean, you know, well, Surrender, I think, is a little heavier than Cherry Baby. I mean, may maybe that worked against them, perhaps? Well, it's funny because, you know, Cherry Baby is probably the poppiest song on that album. The, the album's called Violation. It's their yeah. sec it stars the second album. And when that almost hit, when that almost got into the top 30, you know, and didn't quite make it, um, Bill O'Coin and Capitol told the band, you got to write hits. You got to write pop songs in the vein of Cherry Baby. And this is what Michael Lee Smith told me, you know, the, the vocalist, lyricist for the band. He told me that, you know, he was told by O'Coin, you got to write the hits. You got to write hit songs, pop songs. So their next album, Attention Shoppers, um, really, you know, had a lot of poppier sa sounds on it. And it disappointed the band, a band... They're not happy with that record. They don't. They, they're not. They're not thrilled the way it came out. Yeah. Um, but it does have some of some of what I think are their best songs on it. So, um, you know, there. It's a catch twenty two. It's like, are they not hard enough to 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 be legitimate on rock radio or or pop radio, or are they too poppy to make it as a hard rock band? So they were kind of caught in the middle in a way. Yeah, I I remember that time period because I started getting into music, uh, you know, in 1977, I bought my very first record, which was Kiss Love Gun. Um, my uh, mother took me to Twin Fair the day after Elvis Presley died, and she bought mm -hmm. an Elvis record. And of course, she, you know, she said, go ahead, buy any record you want. So it's Kiss Love Gun. And pretty much from there, I was hooked. And I remember listening to 97 Rock here in Buffalo. And um, and I think you mentioned in your book that, that Stars actually played a showcase for 97 Rock. And, and there was also a picture of stars playing at Rich Stadium from 1977 yes. in your book. I mean, I love the Buffalo references in the book. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. And uh, I, but I never remember hearing stars on 97 Rock during that yeah. time. Even Cherry Baby, when I when I started like you know discovering the stars like years afterwards, Cherry Baby sounded really familiar to me. I was like, I heard this song before, but I couldn't remember where. And I didn't think it was 97 Rock. I think it may have been on like you know maybe because at the time AM stations used to be playing you know, songs, songs like that, you know, so I'm thinking maybe I heard that on AM or, or that, but it sounded very familiar. Yeah, it's funny, you know, uh, I, I actually, Stars was the, the, of the four bands, Stars was the last one that I actually got into. I, I, I had seen their logo and their album covers back in the 70s, but I never really paid attention, to be honest, and I didn't really discover them 
until um, Ryko Disc re-released their albums on CD in 2005, yeah. which is when I pretty much I first heard them. And then they started doing some reunion shows um, around, I was living in New York at the time and they were playing these shows in New York and New Jersey. So I went to see them and I really liked them. So that's kind of, you know, how they came into my musical picture. Right. Um, an another thing about all, all, well, three of the bit, Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, um, and Kiss is that they all had like, <laughs> they all had almost career ending points at, at one point. I, I, and again, I, I referenced back when I started listening to Kiss, um, when, when I started uh, seventh grade in, in 1977, it was really cool to like Kiss. But by the end of the year, you couldn't like Kiss, man. You would mm -hmm. get your ass kicked. And you know, a lot, and I know Eddie Trump talks about this a lot, but it's true. I mean, by that time, in that very short period of time, everyone went into like, you know, Aerosmith was popular then, and you had to be in the Zeppelin, and it wasn't cool to like Kiss. There was just, at least in 1977, there was just like maybe like four months where it was all right. And then they had their, they went on tour for Love Gun. I remember they played in Buffalo in January. And you know, a lot of people from school went to that. I, I unfortunately did not. I didn't see him the first time until Dynasty. But it, but then the popularity just dropped off, and it, it took a while for them to get popular. Cheap Trick, uh, Budokan, they're very popular. They, they, I mean, it, you know, uh, Heaven Tonight. It took a while. For, it took a while. That record was great. Budokan came out. They're like playing arenas, and then again, they they kind of hit a brick wall as well. And then we all know with Aerosmith, with Joe Perry leaving, you know, that band struggled as well. So all three bands kind of like, you know, had hit like a brick wall, and and you know, three of them did resurrect and became, you know, rock and roll yeah. and bands. It, it actually, it's funny you say that because, you know, I, I was in high school and I started high school in 77 and they, no one in my high school liked Kiss. There, there was me and one other guy and that was it. So, you know, one of the points I make in the book is that when you become a Kiss fan, it's like you have to find ways to justify being a Kiss fan yeah, and sure. defending the band because they got a lot of sh they got a lot of shit back in the day and you know and and as you say all all three of the three of these bands you know kind of hit a wall at a certain point pretty much almost at the same time I mean in Kiss's um, in, in in for Kiss it was Di it was pretty much after Dynasty yeah um, and and Peter Chris at that time was checking out of the band. Um, like you said, with, with uh, Aerosmith, it was, it was Joe Perry leaving the band. And then with Cheap Trick, it was Tom Peterson leaving the band. So they were all left, you know, they all um, endured having um, a major part of the band leave. And, you know, it, it, the fortunes change. They just, they just do um, when that happens in a band. It's, it's, very, it's very rare when a band can like bounce back immediately with a new member. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, part of, part of, you know, the answer to your question. So. Yeah. And, and it, you know, they all, they all were able to bounce back and, and in some cases, um, well, I don't know. And I mean, there's, there, I would say they're almost as popular as they, they were at the peak. I mean, Kiss made without the, you know, two other original members. I mean, they're doing all right. Maybe not as popular as they were in like, you know, 1976, 1977, but but you could argue that point. Aerosmith, same thing. I mean, they, they still can sell out arenas. Uh, Cheap Trick, they, they were only an arena headlining band for a little while. But I mean, you know, they, they do all right. You know, they, they, they do all right. And uh, now stars after your book, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be playing arenas now too. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny, you know, before the pandemic hit, um, you know, Aerosmith were in Las Vegas doing this residency. Um, Kiss were on their tour, their end of the road tour, and I went to two of those shows, and they were they were great. I mean, yeah. you know, Kiss is they're still great. There's no question. Um, and Cheap Trick were playing; they were touring as well. And Stars were actually just about to go out on tour with Angel um, right before the pandemic hit. So yeah. all of these bands, you know, fe they they all feature guys who are in their seventies. And they're, you know, they're out there plugging away and they're still playing, you know, Kiss are doing this, um, this huge um, New Year's Eve show in Dubai, a live streaming event. So, you know, there's, there's, they're still, I mean, they're still giving it a try. And, you know, you guy, I, I really admire that in these bands. Um, yeah. A lot of them would throw in the towel at this point, but no, they're, they're, they're continuing. Mm -hmm. 
All right, Doug. Um, I, I want to uh, thank you for your time. Um, I, I do want to ask you, what is next for you? I mean, this, this is this is a, an amazing book. And again, I want to make sure that anybody that's interested in hard rock goes out and buys this book. I mean, there's a million rock books out there. This is one you must have. I mean, like again, it is genius how you were able to like interweave all these like these four bands together into this great story. It's something, a book that, it's one of those books that I just could not put down. It was like, I didn't care if I had to work at six o'clock in the morning and it was like already midnight. I was going to continue reading. I wasn't going to read anymore. It was that good. So what is next for you, Doug? Well, that's, I, listen, I appreciate those kind words and, and, and that's exactly what I try to do with this book. And, and I, I wanted, you know, true, true hardcore fans like you to sort of appreciate the, you know, the, all the interconnections and it's, it's, it, it thrills me to hear you say that. What's next for me? Um, it's, it's, I have another book in mind. Uh, it's probably not going to be a music book. It might be, it might not be, uh, but I'm definitely going to get to work fairly soon on a new thing. And I have a couple of, couple of ideas in my head right now and, and we'll see, but some, something's coming. For sure. All right. Sounds good. Well, let's make sure we get together and uh, we'll talk then. All right, Doug. Sounds good. Thanks so much. I appreciate right. it. You're welcome, Doug. Take it easy. Take Bye. care. <laughs> okay, that was great. Thank you. Oh thank yeah, you. thank you very much. I, yeah, I, was, I, like, I really enjoy the book. And I, 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 I totally appreciate what you just said about it. And and it's funny, you know, when I first came up with this book, people were asking me why stars, why stars. I think I told you that. And then now that I've written the book, like all the interviews and podcasts and radio radio interviews I'm doing all people want to talk about is stars. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's great. That's they, like, it's they what always, I want. They yeah. owe you everything. Any success yeah. that I get from this, uh, this point on, they owe to you. I mean, uh -oh. they, they have such, such great songs. It's just unbelievable. All, all four of uh, those four records are great. And um, yeah, I just, I, I just can't remember like ever hearing them on 97 Rock. And that was the thing. You had to have a song on 97 yeah. Rock in Buffalo. That yeah. was the rock station. If you did not forget it, you were nobody, you know? And yeah. Just, and yeah, and back then it was all about regional airplay. It's like they got some airplay like in Texas. I think they were big in like San Antonio for a minute, but no one else played. I never heard their music in New York. Mm -hmm. Never. Yeah. You know, New York City, never. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really hope that once this is finished, this pandemic crap, that I hope they go back on tour with Angel and I hope they play Buffalo. Yeah. I would love to see that. And they were good. I saw them. I've seen them a number of times in the past few years. And I mean, I see, I see cheap trick whenever the opportunity arises. So they're, they're all really good still, which is, you know, you can't say that up by, you know, about a lot of bands that have been around for, yeah. 50, for 45 years, but they, they all still do really well. Yeah. I would love to see, um, one of my favorite bands from being from Buffalo is the Goo Goo Dolls, of course. And, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I would love to see the Goo Goo Dolls eat Cherry Baby. I, I, I would love <laughs> to see them cover that. I just think Johnny could just like nail that. You know what? It's like, the, I, I hear you. It's like they, they're a band who who need to be rediscovered and people need to cover their music. I mean, I, I don't know if, if you saw it, but I, I posted, um, I did a Spotify, a Spotify playlist of 101 songs, like a soundtrack to the book. Mm -hmm. It's six, six and a half hours long. And one of the songs is a cover that Ricky Rocket and oh, yeah, Brett remember. Michaels Brett Michaels did for Ricky's solo album. Yeah, so like, that came out there. in 2003, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, it's, I, I, would, I would love to see that too. And, I, you know, and one of the things that Rick Nielsen said to me was, I wish more bands would cover my song because he's like the chief songwriter. He makes all the money through the yeah. songwriting. So yeah, I mean, we could talk a whole hour just on Cheap Trick alone. I think. <laughs> yeah, Cheap Trick well, was kind of like weird here because I mean, like I said, they they kind of like they were playing arenas and all of a sudden just like dropped out. Like yeah. right after Peterson left, I remember they yeah. had a show um, with Cheap Trick and UFO scheduled for the Odd here, the big hockey arena. And then, like they had, they had to like dwindle it down to like a theater because tickets just weren't selling. And like a year ago, they were like, you know, did really well at the arena. So it's like in well, a year's time. Nineteen eighty, I saw Cheap Trick at Ma Madison Square Garden, which was their first, first and only arena show in New York ever. They never, they never headlined an arena. They always opened. I mean, I saw them subsequently open for Aerosmith. They opened for Robert Plant, but they did their only headline show at the Garden. 
And then the next year after Tom left, they played Radio City Music Hall. And you, you, they went from 16,000 to 5,000 in one year. In one year, I know. Yeah. It's crazy how that worked back then. I mean, it seemed like the fans were real fickle back then, but it, it, they didn't, yeah. there were just so many, there weren't as many bands as there are now. So it never really made sense to me why a band would drop off the face of the earth like that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, again, thank you, Doug, and uh, good talking to you. And uh, let's let's do this again. Your next book. Oh, um, no matter what. To. <laughs> I appreciate that. You got it. All right. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Take it easy. Take care.